morning. Everyone, calm down. Hopefully, everyone will uh, uh, be safe this weekend. Uh, uh, no one has class tomorrow, right? I don't think so. No. Some of you do. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully by Tuesday, when you see me next, this will all have blown past. But I encourage you all to uh, be safe this weekend. Um, the attendance is on. Most of you checked in. Um, it does this weird thing where by default it asks for location and I have to disable it. So if I forget to ask for location, um, you can just yell at me and I'll, I'll toggle it off. Um, I'll leave this off for another 30 seconds for the attendance. Uh, yeah, no, I know, I undid it. You have to close the app and come back in. That's the way it works. You got it? Okay, I'll leave this in for another 30 seconds. Um, in our last class, we began the topic of the contract of sale. And we discussed that the most important aspect of the contract of sale is the provision that says the title is marketable. Um, a synonym for marketable is merchantable. They're, they're the same thing, they're used in um, different contexts. So I want to start off with a question, uh, a true false question. Okay. I have to uh, terminate the attendance. If you're not here yet, you're not here yet. Okay. All right, so the questions for you is this. That's your question. If a buyer acquires a title with a defect, the title cannot be marketable. True or false, okay? If the buyer acquires a title with defects, the title cannot be marketable. True or false? A is true, B is false. I'm going to put the questions up here very clear so that way there's no dispute, everyone understands it. All right, go. That's your question. True or false? Okay, give another. 10 seconds or so. Okay. I'll cut it off from five, four, three, two, one. All right? Okay. Uh, where did I drop off last time? Who was the last? Oh! Cody, I appreciate your honesty. That's right. You were, you were, uh, you were, you were up first. So, sir, what'd you put? A or B? Uh, I put B. You put B. You said it's false. Why did you put false? Uh, because just because there are certain effects. I, I just on the understanding that it then absolutely the title is not marketable. So can a title of defects be marketable at all? Uh, I believe it can be. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it can be. So is that is this statement then true or false? He yeah. says false. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure everyone gets a double negative, right? It cannot be false. Like, I'm sorry, it cannot be marketable. That means, so your answer is false, right? Correct. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I framed the question this way very deliberately. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, who's actually next? Not not like next for, for special circumstances. I answered the last question. You asked the last question, Amy, you were last? I, th I think you're up, okay. Uh, what'd you put? I can't see your name, Dad. Nicole, sorry. Okay, why is it false? I just think it depends on the defect. It doesn't depends on the defect, okay. So some defects may be big, some defects may be little. Okay. Did anyone put true? Okay, so which put true? Why why did you decide that option? I put true because the other day you said easy contracts are good and merchantable. Uh -huh. I mean if there's a defect depending on what type of defect it is, it can't be it's not necessarily merchantable. So ah, okay. Good. Okay, anyone else put true? Anyone else put true? Uh, Virginia, Ms. Matt. Uh, I just remember you saying that. Okay. So I could have remembered that. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, just because something uh, that was in person told me that the buyer can't wait to sell. Oh, what do you mean waive? Waive. Waive the merchantability. How, how would a buyer waive the required the the of merchantability? By negotiating some sort of um, release by the seller. And how would the buyer be on notice that 
there might be defects in the title. Or, what could the seller do up front? Disclosures. Ah, so we have a couple concepts here that I think are important to stress, right? So a couple of you said, you know, maybe if the defect is very little, you know, it doesn't really affect merchantability. Um, someone else said, uh, well, maybe if, the, if there's a disclosure of some sort and the buyer accepts it, okay? And then someone else said, it doesn't matter the size of the defect. If there's a defect, it's not merchantable. Let's, let's see what we got here. Okay, so the results are, are pretty, pretty staggeringly B. Um, I think that's the better answer, but I want to I want to caveat that. So I think the better answer is B, false, right? You can have a title with defects and it can still be marketable, right? How? People can choose to buy defective property, right? I'll get you a second. Often, property that's cheap is cheap because there are problems with it, and you may want to buy something on the cheap because you know there's problems with it. Especially where there's disclosure being made. If I'm the seller, I say, look, you got all these problems on this property, right? I don't have all the paperwork. Um, there might be some sort of a governmental easement on it or restriction on it, I don't really know. I'm just gonna sell it to you, you know, as is. You ever seen a car, a used car lot, like as is in the window, right? You've seen that, right? I'm selling this to you as is. There's no warranty, there's no guarantee it's in good shape. I'm just gonna dump it on you. So in that case, you can still buy a piece of property. And if you have the proper disclosures, the court can say that the title is marketable. But the important point, I keep using this D word, right? Disclosures. Um, what our readings today discuss is what sort of provisions need to be in the contract in order to make it marketable. That is, you can still have a property with defects so long as the contract um, puts the buyer on fair notice of those issues, right? So the same piece of property could be marketable, could not be marketable, but depending on the sorts of information provided at the time it's purchased, that often makes the difference. That makes sense. Everyone okay with that question? I, th I think, yeah, most of you got it right. I think the answer in this case is B. And I apologize framing in a double negative, but that, that was the only way of getting at this issue. Okay? All right. So let's start our discussion today with the first case. Um, Lohmeyer versus Bauer. It's a case from Kansas. I apologize. This case is not an easy one to read. Um, every semester when I read them, I'm like, wow. Um, Kansas, me, periods. They don't they have these run-on sentences that go on, <laughs> right? I, I, I have a personal rule, any sentence is more than three lines, I break up. After that point, your brain loses track of the subject. You have no idea what the sentence is, you have to read it three times. So I hate long sentences, they're, they're, they're annoying. Um, so unfortunately, oh, it's still ticking. There we go. So unfortunately, uh, uh, you're stuck with this one. Katie? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That, the, the last little bit was struck today. I took an educated guess. Uh, Katie. Uh, Generally speaking, give me the facts in um, uh, Lohmeyer. Um, so the Lohmeyers are buying um, land and property that cost from the Bowers. And Good. Um, basically, there's all these um, restrictions on the property um, saying that it has to be two stories and that it can't be uh, within a certain distance from the property line, but it violates all of those restrictions. So now they want to get <clears throat> Okay, very good. So we have the situation, right? The low Myers go to buy a piece of property. They get a contract. Okay, the contract says, we will convey, quote, good merchantable title. Good merchantable title. That's marketable, same, same meaning. But we have this expression, this clause, right, in the, in the contract. And it says, subject, however, to all restrictions and easements of record applying to this property. Okay, let's see it again. Subject, however, to all restrictions and easements of record applying to this property. Antonella, what, what's the significance of that language that, that I just read twice for you? Ah, so just saying 
I'm selling this to you. There may not be an engine in the hood, right? There are no wheels. There's no, there's no windows. There's not even a car, just like, just like a frame, right? Is that what this clause is getting at? Okay, so let's break it down, Antonella, for me. It says, subject to all restrictions and easements. Okay, uh, we mentioned easements before, but an easement basically means someone has the right to cross over your land. So that's one part. What's subject to restriction? What kind of restrictions can we be talking about here? Zoning, right. So you live in Houston, one of the rarest cities in the country without an official zoning code, you have an indirect zoning code. But in virtually every city in the nation, every piece of property is subject to a zoning code. So does this suggest that this land may be subject to a zoning code? Is that okay? Okay. So indeed, we do have a zoning code in this in, in a situation, right? Tyler, what are some of the zoning issues concerning this piece of property? Uh, well, one of the zoning says that there can there can not be two story properties. Ah. Um, How many stories we got here? Okay. So I want you just to distinguish these two factors, right? There's no problem with having a zoning law by itself. But, Tyler, what's, what's actually the problem here? The fact that there's a zoning law or the fact that... What, what's actually problematic here? The problem is there's already a house on the property. And it's... It, does it comport with the zoning law? No. <laughs> it, it's a finished sentence. It, what does it do to the uh, zoning law? Violates it. Violates it, yes. So, distinguish these two concepts, right? There's no problem with the existence of zoning law. The fact that every city in the country except Houston has some sort of zoning law. However, the problem arises when the zoning law is being violated, right? So the question is this: Does this this phrase "subject, however, to all restrictions and record" I'm sorry, easements of record applying to this property, right? Uh, 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 Jillian, does that mean that you're taking this even though you're in violation of zoning laws? Taking. Yeah, right. You're taking this even though there's violation. Does that clause, though, say uh, that title then is marketable if the laws are being violated? No. Good. That's the important part. This provision does not give you an as is for zoning violations, right? This provision only says there may be zoning laws in effect, you are subject to them. Right? The mere fact that you're subject to zoning laws doesn't make it unmarketable. But if the zoning laws are being violated, right, that is what renders the land unmarketable. Uh, I don't see any text. Mike, sorry. Mike? Yeah. bring it next time. Why is a violation of a zoning law rendered the title marketable? Because we um, put them in a situation where they're Ah! So what actually then is the definition of marketable? I, I've kind of tiptoed around this, this this issue, but how does the court here um, define uh, merchantable or marketable? Um, the Kansas court, at least. I, I have that the, the fact that the contract was essentially in violation of itself. How does the court in Kansas define a marketable title? It gives a definition, a pretty good definition, I think. One sentence. Oh, uh, in the, in the um, block quote? Sure, the wherever it is. The title is a real estate loan, which is free of reasonable doubt, and a title, um, and a title that's doubtful and unmarkable is exposed to the public order. Ah, very good. So we have this definition, right? I think this is a pretty good definition. A marketable title to real estate is one which is free from reasonable doubt, and a title is doubtful and a marketable title if it exposes the party holding it to the hazards of litigation. Isaac, tell me, what does that mean? It means that um, essentially if you're guaranteeing the contract uh, that you have the right to convey the property, um, that it's you as the buyer are not going to be subject to conditions that might require litigation, and you're going to be subject to uh, conditions that would make you say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not going to buy this property. Very good, very good. Okay. Everyone heard what we just said. When you are buying a piece of property, right, you're not just concerned about, you know, is the house in good shape? You know, is the, is the grass, you know, well watered? 
uh, uh, does a wall need a fresh coat of paint, right? You're going to be concerned about that stuff, but the, the legal perspective, what really is going to mess you up if you're subject to litigation? You walk into that property, and day number one, you get sued for violation of a zoning ordinance. Day number one, you get sued because you're, you're, you're breaking a covenant, right? That legal jeopardy is what makes a title marketable. If there's like a crack in the roof, or maybe a crack in the foundation, those are all problems which you can get uh, 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 the contract rescinded or canceled on. But when we talk about marketability, we're talking about legal defects. In fact, this question I framed it somewhat vague. I didn't say what defects were. I did that quite deliberately. We're talking about legal defects. That is defect in your title. That is, someone can sue you over this because your house is too tall, or in this case, it's too close to the sidewalk, right? So the mere existence of zoning laws, the mere existence of covenant, the mere existence of easement, that does not render a title unmarketable. What renders the title unmarketable is if those things are being violated and the seller is selling it to you knowing that they're being violated. Right? There doesn't have to even be pending litigation, right? Maybe the city hasn't brought a zoning you know, prosecution against you, but they could. So the prospect, like the possibility of um, litigation against your title, that is what renders a zoning ordinance, I'm sorry, that's what renders a title unmarketable. Yeah. So you said it's the, the violation of the zoning law and the seller knows that it's being violated, so it has to be both? Um, not necessarily. So if, if the seller, if the seller is unaware, right, that the zoning ordinance is being violated, um, that may come up in a, uh, what do you call it, like a survey, right? So let's say, let's say when you're buying a piece of property, you hire a lawyer, and the lawyer investigates the zoning code, and he discovers there's a violation. Even if the seller is unaware, you can still move to rescind the contract. If the seller doesn't disclose it, though, that bleeds into the next topic of you actually get help for damages. So, so you don't, the title, the unmarkability of the title doesn't depend on whether the seller knows it or not. But if he knows about it and fails to disclose it, you can sue for fraud. I'm sorry, I, I didn't make that quite clear, but I appreciate the, the clarifying question. Right? So the seller, right, if he knows about it, got to disclose it. If he fails to disclose it, then we go into the next doctrine of whether it's committing a fraud. But in any event, regardless of the fraud, the title is not marketable if there are these violations. Uh, yes, sir, uh, brother. Um, but the buyer still has the option of just waiving all this and buying it. Yes, that was my very next point, right? So, um, uh, hey, Caitlin, but what happens if the seller discloses and he says, look, I know this land is um, in violation of the zoning ordinance, it's too close to the sidewalk, <laughs> but if, like, you know, you, you, you reduce the width of the property to something else, you'll be in compliance. I want to sell it to you at half price, waiving everything. Can the transaction still be sold? Is the title still marketable? I think so, as long as you tell the, 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 the buyer and the owner. Why? Uh, because then that's just like a defect in the title. And you can yes. Use yeah, and which, which is why this question, the way I posed it the way I did, um, you can sell a piece of defective property. There's nothing wrong with that. And again, it usually means it's cheaper. If you want to take a speculation, you want to take a gamble, you want to take a risk on buying some cheap property that's got a lot of problems with it, and maybe some problems you don't even know about, you take a risk, you take a gamble. Lots of people, uh, wait a second, a lot of people speculate on land. But you can't come back and complain that the title's unmarketable. The reason why marketability of title is important is it gets you out of the contract. You can actually rescind the contract itself because of these errors. After the transaction's closed, after you pay the mortgage, after the keys are transferred, you come back in and say, wait a minute, I want to cancel out this contract. Chester? Um, even if they were to lay aside accepting the faults or whatever, what you 
I'm sorry, re your, repeat your question? Would unconscionability ever come into play? Unconscionability, remind your classmates from last semester. What's unconscionability? That's a super unfair. Okay, good. Right, so this is a contract document, right? And I remember contract parties as well as you do. It's really unfair. There's not any sort of bright line rule. It's, it's just really grossly unfair, whatever that means. Um, so I'll give you a couple answers. First, historically, contract doctrine and property doctrine are very separate. Um, so there's not really, historically at least, a doctrine of unconscionability in property law. But in recent decades, I think the Florida decision is a good, the Florida Supreme Court decision, the Johnson case, illustrates this. Courts have been um, injecting contract and tort doctrine into property law. So perhaps we do have um, something akin to um, unconscionability uh, uh, and, and that courts can say this was such a grossly unfair transaction that the title is not marketable. So they're not going to use the words unconscionable, but the same notion that you didn't disclose this really thing and there's a really big problem and it's unfair, they can say that renders the title marketable, therefore you're sending the contract. So it's not going to be called unconscionability, but the same um, principles likely carry over. Even after a word. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. And, and uh, I would say at least, even in the Florida case, property law is still a little bit stricter than contracts, where it's not as forgiving, but that, that could come into play, even, with, even if the waiver wasn't fully disclosing everything else. Yeah, I, I was talking to a friend recently, there's a new um, application of contracts to uh, technology. So imagine uh, you buy a car on a, with a subprime loan, meaning you have no credit, and then you get a car in installments. You know, you know the commercials. No credit, bad credit, even the repo. Like you've seen these commercials, right? <laughs> so the contract has a term that says, we're going to put a special card inside your, inside your car. And if you stop paying your bills, we disable the car remotely. So you, you can't turn the car on. Because usually what happens is they repossess it, right? They try and track it down. They find it. They come at night. They tow it away. Maybe you put it in a garage. They can't find it, whatever. Here, they can, by GPS and data, they can just remotely disable the car. And there's a question whether that, not, not while you're driving, it'll let you stop the car, right? But once it's in park, it stays in park, no matter where it is, park on the street, wherever it is, and then they come get it. Uh, and there's a question of whether that contract, even if there's full disclosure of it, becomes unconscionable. I was talking with a friend about this yesterday. I haven't thought about it enough, but uh, food, food for your thought. Yeah. <laughs> tricky, tricky, right? Uh, the, the car just, I mean, you, you actually, uh, we take it we take for granted a lot of these smart cars that we have can be hacked. Um, and um, uh, there was an experiment, I think a year ago, where someone was able to actually take control of someone else's car and drive it uh, remotely. Uh, they started by messing with like the air conditioner, turning it all the way up, turning it all the way down, opening and closing the windows, turning the lights on and off. This was all this is all uh, uh, cooperative. They did this like you know as a team, but they want to see how far they can go. Uh, this requires a hooking your phone up to a, a cell phone, but anyway, it's stuff to think about. Back to property. <laughs> um, so at bottom, the court held that the mere existence of these encumbrances doesn't render, by the way, encumbrance is a synonym for defect. It's, a, it's the same thing. So the mere existence of an encumbrance does not render a title marketable, but the violation of it does. And as a result, because the title is not marketable, the contract could be rescinded, even though the transaction would otherwise close. Okay, uh, Amy. Is it accurate to think of this as a title of defect makes it voidable, not necessarily void? Oh, good, good, good language. Remind your classmates, what's the difference between voidable and void? Void means it's no good, but if it's voidable, that means that you can back out. So I think it's probably voidable. Um, where if the buyer wants to keep the contract, he can keep it in effect. Only when he goes to court and sues for it, that's when it gets voided. So I think it's voidable, I, I think, between the two. But very, very good distinction. People remembering their contracts was very, very, very impressed. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, you said. You, there were two different violations, but Bowers tried to buy that extra land, so he had a violation in conveyance to him as well. Uh, well, he wasn't interested in buying that extra land, right? Um, I don't know the specifics of Kansas zoning law. Maybe buying that extra land would not have remedied the problem. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. The fact is, the buyer didn't want to take that risk. He wanted out. Yeah, exactly, right? 
he he's not going to be required to go ahead and buy that extra two feet of land because he says, look, you sold this to me in a certain condition, it's not marketable, I want out. And he doesn't want to deal with it. Also the fact that the house was probably too tall, you know, that that, that, that probably bothered him more. But this this was you found the violation and you're out. Uh, Bradley, yes, sir. When it's uh, in HOA's, like... HOA's Homeowners Association for the Uninitiated. Uh, <laughs> type zoning thing, what power do they have if it's a two-story home and you're in a one-story area? Like, well, we'll talk about uh, homeowners associations later, but the basic gist is it's not zoning. Um, zoning is imposed by the government. Right? A homeowner association is not government, it's a private group of people. What they do use is something called a covenant. Right? You often see in Houston signs that say deed restricted community, you see these signs all over the place. What that means is when the land was actually sold, uh, a, a deed covenant was put on it, which means this land can only be used in a certain way. And one of the restrictions can be only one story house, only two story houses, only you know, apartment buildings, whatever it happens to be. Um, one of the reasons why uh, homeowners associations use these sorts of covenants, saying that only two-story houses is they want bigger families and usually richer people. Uh, they don't want like you know a one-story bungalow. They want a big house with a higher tax base. Uh, this is not a, it's not a mystery. So one of the ways that homeowners associations they can't really exclude people by price. They say okay, but you need this size house, this size backyard, this size frontage, you know, this size driveway, which makes building uh, much more expensive. Okay. What else? Uh, John Paul. So, um, they specifically said that there was provisions to allow time to cure, but the court said that because of addition, an addition to the loan that it terminates the contract. Now, if it wasn't an addition, like purchase of additional loan it was within the home, well, by the time, this gets a little fuzzy, by the time you have the closing, right, if the violation at that point exists, I, I think that's been entitled not marketable. Uh, I think the time to cure it comes before closing. But this one, uh, 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 he wanted out, he got out. The important point to stress is had they disclosed this on the deed, I'm sorry, on the contract, they would have had these marketability problems, but the failure to disclose it created these issues. Okay, what else? What else? Anything else in this case? Okay, so so you know for the future, one way that title can be rendered unmarketable is if it violates a covenant easement or zoning law. The mere existence of those things do not render the title unmarketable, it's the violation thereof. Okay. Okay, any questions? I'll mention briefly on page 582 this doctrine of equitable conversion. Um, which it looks a lot more complicated than it actually is, and I'll explain it to you in a very simple fashion. Um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, on, let's use today, on August 24th, you purchased a pop property in Brace Bayou, right? Which is just today. And your closing is scheduled for Monday. And <laughs> Harvey rolls in over the weekend and inflicts damage. Let's make this a little bit too close to home. Um, Again, you already signed the contract today, closing's on Monday. I'm exaggerating a bit, but you sign the contract now, closing's after the hurricane rolls in. Um, it inflicts massive damage to the property, there's flooding in the basement, you need mold removal, I mean, you know, big, not basement's decent, but you know, it inflicts damage on the property. Who bears the cost of that damage? So the doctrine of equitable conversion says, basically, when the buyer buys something, right, he already has an equitable title, right? Even though the transaction is not completed, the buyer is an equitable title. The seller basically has an interest in it. 
So basically the buyer is the actual owner. So in the usual case, right, the usual case, when a court orders specific performance says, seller, you have to transfer land to the buyer, it's not that big of a deal because the buyer already had this equitable title to it. He already basically had it, just they didn't go through the motions. However, equitable, right? Equity and fairness. Courts can hold, well, that may be true in the usual case, but in the case of Hurricane Harvey, or whatever it will be called, uh, uh, we're not gonna hold that. And we'll hold that the seller bears the cost of the risk, all right? This, this is something of a split of authority on it, and I'm not gonna give you a majority minority because it's gonna be very fact-bound, but equitable conversion allows courts to go either way, right? They can go both ways. They can say, well, the buyer signed the contract, therefore he's the equitable owner, we're gonna order specific performance. Give it to the buyer, or courts can hold, and out of fairness, the seller is a least cost avoider. He's in the better position to make the repairs. We'll give it to the seller. It's not a fixed doctrine, which is why I think the text on 582 makes it a little bit uh, confusing. But it's, a, it's an equitable doctrine, and it can go both ways. And that's all I have to say about that. Uh, yeah, David? Uh, is there a, is that somehow related to like act of God or something like when? Well, there's a concept of force majeure, right? You remember that act of God. Um, Generally, if there's some sort of act of God, it's the excuses your performance of a contract. So, um, if any of you have a contract performed over the weekend, odds are it will not be performed. Uh, it, it simply won't. Um, one of my favorite force majeures ever, I was in Washington, D.C. in 2009, for law school, uh, during the inauguration. And uh, the thing I remember most about that day is my cell phone had broken. I needed a new one. And FedEx was supposed to deliver it to me that day. And because of the, the mass of traffic inside District of Columbia and the surrounding areas, it basically shut down all the roads. And so FedEx on my tracking number actually said, force majeure, can't deliver inauguration. Uh, <laughs> which I had to chuckle on. Uh, right. So I actually had to drive to the depot with all these back roads to get my phone. I got my phone eventually. Um, I, I listened to the oath of office given on the radio. I pointed that's not right. Uh, and the rest is history. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, anything else in equal conversion? That's not a very important doctrine. I don't think I'll ever mention it ever again, but it's there in your notes. Anything else? No? Okay. Yeah, hey, Robert. Okay. Um, so, uh, on the exam review, uh, if we run across this, you wouldn't want us to uh, put the majority opinion or minority opinion on, on this topic. I don't think I've ever asked for equal conversion. <laughs> I like that song from Juan. It's the only song I like. You're welcome. Uh, it's, it's very apt. <laughs> I like it. I like that movie. I don't like it. Like, you should do it, but that one I didn't be careful. All right. Uh, anything else? All right. The next case is usually students' favorite case of the semester, or definitely the top five. Uh, uh, the, the law clerk who wrote this and the judge wrote this um, had, a, had a sense of humor, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Justice Scalia would always say when he writes an opinion, especially a dissent, he would write it not for his colleagues, but he would write it for law school casebooks. He, he made a very clear point that when he wrote a dissent, he wanted it to be inserted into a law school casebook. And the way he would do this is using very graphic, memorable language that people are like, wow, what a great phrase, right? Um, I think this judge, whatever his name is, her name is, um, uh, uh, settled, uh, settled his name in the history books by writing this opinion. Um, so what we have here is a haunted house. Um, and I made a mistake a couple years ago, and I said, does anyone here actually believe in haunted houses? And a number of hands went up. I was like, okay. So I won't ask that question again, um, but I'll ask a related question. I, I don't need to pull from this one. How many of you would not buy a house if it was haunted? Okay. That's why I don't ask the other question the way I did. Uh, I, I'd get the bargain and buy it cheap, and I couldn't care less. <laughs> um, uh, but we have this house here. It's in Nyack, New York, uh, which is uh, uh, somewhere outside New York City. Um, and it was reported to be possessed by poltergeists. Um, I found it was an article in the New York Times back from the 1980s that interviewed the owner of the home, Mrs. Ackley. 
And uh, she said she lived in the house for 22 years. And she claimed she saw a ghost once. And here's what she said. I'll read it for you. He was sitting in midair, watching me paint the ceiling in the living room, rocking back and forth. I was on an eight-foot stepladder. I asked if he approved what we were doing to the house. If the colors which was liking, he smiled and nodded his head. So we have ghosts involved in interior decoration. <laughs> I think she saw Beetlejuice and had a dream. Because uh, that's basically the plot of Beetlejuice, right? They redecorated the house, the ghosts came, they didn't like what they're doing to the house. They, that's, it's literally the plot of Beetlejuice. <laughs> a anyway, whatever. I mean, it's, it's like a movie, literally. <laughs> um, Ms. Ackley said one of the other ghosts would waltz into her daughter's bedroom. Quote, we don't know whether or not she was the one who woke up the children by shaking the bed. So children wake up in the middle of the night, they see ghosts, and then the mother tells the newspaper. Okay. Um, ghost number three was a Navy lieutenant during the American Revolution. I don't know how they know his rank, but I guess they figured it out. My, <laughs> sorry if I'm being really skeptical here. Right? It's, uh, it's, it's hard not to. My son saw him eyeball to eyeball outside the basement door. Okay. So... Putting aside frivolity, um, whether or not the house is haunted is actually irrelevant for the court, right? Um, is that page? Why does it not matter to the court whether, in fact, <laughs> the house is actually haunted? Right? Why does it not matter whether there actually are ghosts there? Well, yeah, I mean, that's true, but why does the court not really care whether or not the house is actually haunted? Why does it not matter? Well, that, that, that's true, but there's a better reason, Travis? Whether the purchaser Ah, well, the purchaser and the... The purchaser and who else? The seller? Yes, okay. Now, Travis, did the seller believe it was haunted? Yes. How do we know that? She reported it to the Reader's Digest. Oh, she wasn't just reporting it. What was she trying to do there? <laughs> make money, Yeah, she was trying to make money. So here we have a situation, right? Right? We have a situation where the previous owner of the house was trying to cash in on this haunted, which is why I think it's utterly fair. Um, she was trying to make money. She was giving this information to Reader's Digest. That, that, that was a magazine. There's a little paper thing she used to have for tablets, right? Um, they don't actually have Reader's Digest in school. Do you remember that? Okay, some of you, yeah. Fading, I'm sure. It's a little, little paper magazine. Um, so she would sell her story to Reader's Digest, and apparently there was a ghost tour, right? You see these things, right? Where you are in a neighborhood, and they take you with a little lantern, right? And you bring it to the house, and you see the... the, the, the no, you don't actually see the ghost, but they tell you about the ghost. Someone else saw it 30 years ago. Okay? Um, so the court isn't actually saying that... Um, the house is haunted, but as a matter of law, it is, right? Because that is what is perceived by the seller based on her own um, admissions, and that is what's perceived by the buyer based on uh, uh, the perception, okay? So the first, um, first off, I'll get out. I I'm a fan of puns. The court uses a lot of them here. Uh, the broker has no duty to disclose, I'm sorry, the broker has a phantasmal reputation, uh, the plaintiff <laughs> has a ghost of a chance, <laughs> moved by the spirit of equity, elusive if not ephemeral, there is an obligatory quote to Hamlet, my favorite, who are you going to call? <laughs> Notion that the haunting is a hobgoblin which should be exercised from the body of legal precedent and should be quietly laid to rest. <laughs> Unearthly property's ghoulish reputation, uh, but, but there's lots of pros in there that doesn't really add much, but I like it. It's fun to read. Okay, so the first question is, was a broker under any duty to disclose it? And the court says, no, he's not. Okay? So then we get into this other issue. Um, oh, we got Travis and Travis. Here we go. Travis. Travis, generally, historically, common law, what was a seller's duty with respect to disclosures? What could they not do historically? What do you mean by high? Be more precise. Were they required to disclose it? 
What could they not do? What was prohibited? What could they not do? What was prohibited? They couldn't lie about it. They could not lie about it. If they were asked, are there termites in the wall? And they said, no, there are no termites, and there were, that's fraud. So they couldn't affirmatively lie about it. They couldn't affirmatively mislead, right? So we'll even finish it up. But what if they kept their mouth shut and the buyer didn't ask any questions? We're looking at the term caveat emptor. Caveat emptor, such a good word, right? What's caveat emptor? It's the principle that the buyer alone is responsible for checking the quality and suitability of goods before purchase. Caveat emptor, exactly right, literally means buyer beware. You may have heard this phrase before, buyer beware, right? Caveat emptor. It's the notion that it, it's the duty of the buyer to make all the questions, to make all the inquiries. The flip side of caveat emptor is a seller has no duty to disclose anything. If he's asked about it, he can't lie. But he has no affirmative duty to inquire. Now, Christina, let me ask you this question. Why do you think the doctrine of caveat emptor developed? Does well, well, who does caveat emptor protect? Does it protect buyers? Yeah. So why do you think the doctrine of caveat emptor developed? Ah. Yeah. So caveat emptor puts the burden on the buyer. The burden is firmly on the buyer, and the seller all he has to do is keep his mouth shut. Right? If he keeps his mouth shut, he's home clear. No fraud. Right? Taylor, let me ask you this question. What's the downside, though, to copying a tour? Why is that perhaps a doctor that has fallen into disfavor in recent years? Because it's unfair to a buyer who doesn't necessarily know everything you're supposed to know. Why is it unfair to the buyer? Because it puts a lot of pressure on him. Why does it put pressure on him? Yes, that's the right question. Very good. It puts pressure on the buyer to think of every conceivable thing that can go wrong, right? Now, uh, uh, Elaine, I'll go to you. What are some of the obvious things that a buyer may want to ask about, right? Good. Good, good. Like structural things, right? Like termites or a bad roof or a leaky ceiling or like a foundation crack, right? You can know enough to ask about um, these sorts of standard things. Lane, would anyone think to ask about whether the house is haunted? <laughs> Probably not. Or to use another one, if a house had a murder committed in it previously, right? Or if someone died, <laughs> you proved. Yes, officer. I'll get to a second. But if someone had died in a property, right? That's not your average thing that you would ask about. So what the court is getting at here is caveat emptor is fine, right? But it doesn't it can't apply in a situation where the defect is haunting because no one would think to even ask about it, right? You can bring a get like a exterminator to look for insects. You can bring an engineer to look for a, a crack in the foundation. You can bring a roofer to to you know look for a, a crack to the roof. Uh, but if I may, who are you going to call, right? <laughs> who, who, <laughs> who are you going to call to check for ghosts? You can bring a psychic, Beetlejuice. And this, this, this case is basically Beetlejuice, right? You bring in the psychic here, the ghost, because of the redecoration, and the furniture comes alive, starts eating. Anyone else? Isaac, yes, am I not, sir? I actually have a very on point anecdote. I thought you would. Um, <laughs> a friend of mine was moving to uh, Texas for his job in the Coast Guard, uh -huh. and he had a selected a house down in Santa Fe, and uh, he thought the price was a little bit too low, so he uh -oh. asked me to look into it. And uh, so initially I didn't really find anything, but then uh, after I looked up who the owner was on uh, their appraisal district website and did a little research on the owner, uh -huh. I, find, I found out that uh, that it actually had been the scene of the murder of the oh. wife that uh, shotgun the husband's death. Oh. In the um, 
residence, and uh, I guess they, they painted over by the time they were showing it again. They right? painted over what, the blood? Well, I guess it was clear the blood was painted over the yeah. Body, yeah. Um, but yeah, as a result, he uh, very much did not want to buy it. So. Uh -huh. Well, that's exactly what I said at the outset, right? Um, if a property has a sort of stigma attached to it, odds are they're going to have to drop down the price. Here, they didn't disclose it. Um, and one note, Isaac, your story is a good one because you Googled it, right? You looked it up online. This was a story from the 80s uh, where you couldn't readily Google stuff because it hadn't existed yet for some years. Um, you'd have to go to the library and look at, you know, how would you even know that a Reader's Digest magazine from a certain year covered a story from wherever there's no easy way of even searching for that. So today, searching for these sort of stigmatic events is easier than it was uh, when this case was decided. Okay? But you see what the judge says here, right? He's not getting, getting rid of the caveat emptor doctrine, saying, well, we can keep this doctrine, but it really has no bearing when we're talking about a stigma, because you can't bring an exterminator, you can't bring a roofing guy, you can't bring a, you know, an engineer. No one can discern this unless they are familiar with the neighborhood, they know the history of this house, they've read Reader's Digest in 1985, whatever it was. Um, so this is not like a physical problem. This is a problem of reputation, of information. And the court puts a lot of weight on the fact that the plaintiff, the seller, sorry, that the seller profited off this, that she sold tours for her house, that this was not like a secret. She was all too willing to brag to the newspapers, right, about her haunted house. But when it came time to sell it, she stayed quiet. So, uh, you know, this was Chester's question a few minutes ago. <coughs> Is this unconscionability? No, but it sounds a lot like it, right? That, that there's some sort of unfairness, there's like an equitable thing that uh, uh, the seller told everyone in the world about this haunted house except for the guy buying it. And that, I think, drove the court to this, um, uh, to this, uh, to this spiritual conclusion. <laughs> and of course, this is my favorite, the court puts this at the end. If indeed there are poltergeists there, the house is not vacant. <laughs> Therefore, they haven't delivered a merchantable title because they're still a prior occupant. I, I laugh. I, if you look at my notes, I have LOL in my notes. I laugh every time I get there because it's insane. Uh, but that was the court sense of equity. <laughs> Emma, what did the dissent say? It was a nice, short, and sweet dissent. Um, the doctrine of title endeavors to be determined to be for a more standard version of the guys. Yeah. Uh, basically, yeah, that this is not a reason to uh, uh, carve out an exception to the caveat emptor doctrine, the buyer beware doctrine. This is basically a joke. Um, the, the buyer should have done his homework, basically. Uh, you do a title search, you do a foundation search, you can do a poltergeist search. I don't know how you do that, uh, but I'm sure there's a director or something. Was yes, sir, Isaac. Was there a backstory to this? Like, why did he actually want to get out of the contract? I'm sorry? Why did he want to get out of the contract? Do you know what his actual reason was? I think because it was haunted. Okay. I mean, I just, I asked a show of hands. Virtually every hand went up. Would you buy a house that was rumored to be haunted? Virtually every hand went up. No. Was it the, like the market value? Because it's like a stigma, maybe? Yeah, it was a stigmatic cost. There, there, there was a stigma to the property because of... People don't want to be in a house where there's a murder committed. Like I just said, people don't want to be in a house that was, uh, you know, the site of a haunting or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Uh, whatever. Okay. Any questions on Stambovsky? Right? I wouldn't treat this as any sort of majority rule. Uh, it's a fairly um, isolated. Uh, a, a, a specter of a case um, that probably doesn't arise very often, but it's useful for you to see how the court distinguished the caveat and tort doctrine because of the particularities of um, haunting and ghosts. Anything else? Anything else? No? Uh, yes, sir, Isaac. Uh, a lot of these proactive duties they put in, um, how many of them are... A lot of these what? I didn't hear what you said. Proactive duties to disclose. Uh-huh. Ah, uh, how good, many, good. How many of them are um, statutory? I am so glad you asked that question. So even though we have a doctrine of caveat emptor where it's buyer beware, 
when you look at the form I showed you in class yesterday, the Texas Real Estate Commission form, notice all those disclosures, termites, lead paint, radon, this, 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 right? The reasons why those are there are to help an unknowing buyer. An unknowing buyer won't even know what questions to ask, right? Not his fault, he's simple, right? He has, that's not his business. By putting those disclosures in the form, the government has tried to see every conceivable disclosure that needs to be made. And once you say, no, there are no termites, and then they turn out to be termites, you've committed fraud. So it shifts the burden, right? It puts the burden, instead of just being on the buyer, on the seller as well. So in Texas, we still have the caveat of tour doctrine, but it's um, softened, if you will, by the disclosures required in the statute. Um, some states actually do require disclosures about stigma. I don't think Texas does. Um, if anyone has the experience to tell me, but I think in some states they actually have a requirement to disclose that this was a site of a murder of some sort or a crime was committed there. I don't think it refers to ghosts. I think it's limited to murder, but we all know the way a house gets haunted is because someone gets murdered there, right? Is it, is it? <laughs> really? I don't know. I made that up. Is that true? <laughs> can you have a haunted house if the person didn't die there? I don't know. I think you can, yeah. How did Casper go? I don't, I don't remember. Brutally murdered. And <laughs> Casper brutally murdered? No. <laughs> he's so friendly. He, he's a friendly ghost. Yeah, he's yes, Valerie, yeah. enlighten us, please. Yeah. Casper drowned? How did he drown? I thought Casper was yeah, rich. His mom yeah, died. Yeah, that's what he's rich. 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 All right, okay. Yeah. Enough for Bali. Okay. Uh, shh. Okay, one at a time. Valerie actually raised her hand, so she gets to talk now. I, it's not, I have a general question. Yes. <laughs> bring, us back to, bring us back to this world instead of that one. So let's say there's a contract, you're buying a house, and within the contract they disclose some of these things, but they didn't tell you verbally. Is that still sufficient? If they provide a written disclosure, that's fine. You don't have to say it out loud. In fact, these forms are so long that people probably won't even read them. So if they disclose as a property price, it, it jump right over it. Okay, that make sense? Uh, the contract. Writing is all you need. Now, if the, let's say they're having a, let's say, let me take your example. The seller writes down the form, yes, there are termites. The buyer asks him, so, are there any termites? The guy goes, no, no termites here. Then you got fraud, right? Because you firmly misrepresented it in conflict with what he said at the table. But this is why, uh, I don't read the paper, maybe I should, but, but most people never actually read those forms, because it's, Unless, if you're skimming through it and there's like a yes box, yes, your termites might want to focus on that one. Okay. All right, any other questions on the, the haunted house case? No? Okay. Uh, who am I up to? All right, Emma, I'll come back to you. You had a short question. Um, Emma, what's the difference in these two words up here? Malfeasance and nonfeasance. Malfeasance and nonfeasance. What's what's the difference here, Emma? Nonfeasance is a failure to perform an act that is wrongful. Um let let me ask you the question again, Emma, with some with some facts, right? Let's just use termites, we keep using this example, right? The house was termites all over the place, the chomping away of everyone feasting. Give me an example of non-feasance. We're talking about termites. What would an example of non-feasance be? Um, not disclosing that the house has termites would be required by law. Like well, you went a little bit too far, but let's say non-feasance would be you, you stay quiet, right? Mm -hmm. You say nothing about the termites. What would an example be of malfeasance? With the termites, use the same 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 uh, uh, question. Bradley, just saying like fraudulent. What would you say? Say no, there's there's no termites. Yeah, yeah, you lie about it, right? Right. So, oh, I misspelled it. I'm sorry. Malfeasance would be no. There are no termites here. This house is great. Yeah, the wood's strong. 
Um, Nonfeasance would be uh, staying quiet, not going to say anything. You hear this like chopping in the walls, right? You just you don't say anything. Now, um, uh, Samaria, let me ask you this question. At common law, which of these two things was prohibited at common law? Uh, Only one of them was prohibited. Yeah. Common law prohibited malfeasance. At common law, you could not actively lie about something. But, Samarita, could you stay quiet? Yes. Good. All right? At common law, it was caveat emptor. So if the buyer managed to keep his mouth shut for long enough, right? If the buyer kept his mouth shut and there were no questions asked about termites, he's scot free. Now, a lot of what you see in property two versus property one is the shifting of doctrine, where courts move away from common law. Um, in almost every case, I think I told you in New Jersey, it's always a rule. But in most cases, you read the semester that are somewhat recent, that is the last 20 or 30 years, the court departs from the common law understanding. And this is such a case. Johnson. Uh, Alexandra, what were the facts in uh, Johnson versus Davis? Okay, so the Johnsons were selling their home to the Davises, and they knew that there was problems with the roof, but they didn't say anything. And well, what, what, what was wrong with the roof? Let's be, let's be oh, precise. It was a leaky roof. Big problem, right? Yeah. Okay, so they didn't tell about the leaky roof, then what happened? Um, a few days later, it was a bunch of rain, yeah. and they went to the house, and water was cold, gushing. Yeah, yeah. And. Um, they wanted to rescind after that. Okay, so let's just get the chronology down, right? The house was sold for about three hundred thousand dollars. The seller knew there was a leaky roof, but affirmatively misrepresented there was nothing wrong with the roof. Alex, is this malfeasance or nonfeasance? Oh, that's malfeasance. Exactly right. This is malfeasance. They knew there was a problem and they flat out lied about it, right? So even under the common law, you can't do malfeasance. That's 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 pretty. Uh, shortly after they, they made the deposit, they moved in, and, uh, I'm sorry, no, they made the deposit and the water started gushing. Then they started to rescind the contract and return the deposit. Um, actually, this happened to me um, when I moved from Pennsylvania to Kentucky after my clerk, one clerk to the next. Uh, I moved into an apartment maybe like two in the afternoon. Within an hour of getting there, I had this horrible downpour and it was a storm and water was coming in through the windows. And like, I didn't even my furniture. Like, I had gotten there an hour ago and I, I didn't know about this case yet, but uh, I was thinking about getting out. That was the only time the entire year that had such rain. There was this really bad storm. Uh, uh, but this stuff happens. Okay. So, as a matter of malfeasance, this case is easy. They affirmatively um, uh, misled the buyer, so you can rescind the contract and also recovery of the deposit. Now, Valerie, why did the court stop there? Why do you have to keep reading like, all these other pages when the case was resolved? I mean, this is an easy case. It's malfeasance, black letter, done. Why did the court keep going here? Well, they wanted to um, kind of take away the Was this the right case to do it? Is this a proper role for the court to do it in this decision? Well, they didn't need to. No, they didn't. Why did they need to do it here? You're right. Why, why did the court not need to reach this, this issue and reverse this common law doctrine? Because they already had a whole Yeah. So I, I, this is a property class, but also a law class. They want you to focus on legal process. This entire case was, 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 was worthless, right? The entirety of this decision is simple. Caveat emptor, the guy engaged in malfeasance, rescind the contract, give him his deposit back, done. But this court, the Supreme Court of Florida, which is called Scoff Law, right? Supreme Court of Florida, Scoff Law. Um, they earned that name in the 2000s. Um, the Supreme Court of Florida decided to go further and reverse 
this common law doctrine of caveat emptor. Now, Natalie, why did the court feel compelled to revisit this doctrine of caveat emptor? Um, they looked at a few recent cases that dealt with this, and they said that Cases are courts moving towards full disclosure of material defects. Now, let me ask you this question, Natalie. What does that mean, courts are moving? What does that actually mean? Courts are moving away from, I guess, the common law. And then why are the courts so moving? We don't think it's fair how it's being applied today. Okay. So when they say the court, the law is moving in direction, what are they actually talking about? By, by whom? By the courts. And who's on courts? Judges. Judges. So who's, who's changing the law here? The judges. Yeah. So let's just be very blunt. Let's be, let's be very uh, uh, blunt about this. When, when you read an opinion that says the law is moving in a certain direction, um, this is not some sort of like, you know, autonomous car, right? This is not like a Google or a Tesla vehicle driving by itself. Um, judges are changing the law themselves. They, they can't quite say it because it's a little bit too naked. But they're saying, yeah, we don't think this whole doctrine is fair. We're changing it. Uh, even though the doctrine is like a couple hundred years old, uh, they're saying, we're going to move away from this, we think it's unfair. And, you know, they cite decisions from maybe, what, maybe four or five different states. Um, notice they don't cite the other 45 states that haven't changed. <laughs> so whenever you see the trend moving, it's bullshit, right? It, 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 <laughs> I, it, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, I don't like cursing class, but it is. They're picking out four or five cases, almost always California, New Jersey, where they've done something crazy. It's like, oh, well, California, let's join them, right? Um, so, so all this stuff about the law moving, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's all window dressing. But let's focus on why they think the caveat emptor doctrine should be abandoned. So Phil, what about caveat emptor uh, so troubled the, uh, the justices in Florida? Um, the fact that, like, if the, if the seller, if the seller knows and just doesn't say anything, and the buyer through their due diligence can't can't figure that out. If there's something that the seller only the seller knows. Do you remember in contracts a doctrine called least cost avoider? Does that sound familiar? No. Okay, I'll give it to you. So. <laughs> uh, I'll go on. Kay, okay, let me ask you this question. Who here is in a better position to know that the leaky, that the ripping leaky, the buyer or the seller? The seller. Okay, yeah, duh, right? Why? <laughs> Why is the seller in a better position to know that the leak, that the, can't say, that the roof is leaky? Because it's his house. It's his house, right? So the seller is in a much better economic position to disclose this information. Yet, the caveat emptor doctrine imposes the burden on whom? The buyer. Right. So there's an economic analysis of it, which actually makes a lot of sense. We should put the burden on the person who has the least cost to fix it, right? The person with the easiest fashion of addressing this problem is not the buyer, but the seller. Yet caveat emptor flips that. Caveat emptor puts the burden on the party with the highest cost to fix the problem, right? Where you have facts that are equally open to both parties, the caveat emptor doctrine works fine. But in almost every case, such as this one, with a leaky roof, the seller has it, okay? So there's another term they describe, describe um, Simone, tell me please, what's a latent defect? What's that phrase mean? They, they use this word a couple times, a latent defect. that's not entirely obvious, that you're not going to see it. It's not like, you know, you have peeling lead paint, right? You walk into a house, you see the paint, okay, you have lead paint. Termites are a good example. A better example is a leaky roof, right? You don't know a roof is leaky till it rains, which is unfortunate. You can't, like, test it. 
I mean, maybe you can. I don't know. Maybe roofers have a way of testing it. But generally, you find out the, the roof is a leak when it starts raining. Um, cracked foundation. This comes up a lot. Anyone ever have a cracked foundation? I've had people. Yeah. It, how, where'd that come up for you? How'd you how'd you get that fixed? I'm sorry. Was it a really big deal to fix? Uh, yeah, because yeah. when the foundation is cracked, you basically, the house is, the, the house is sinking. Mm -hmm. um, you often can't tell if foundations are cracked until you start digging through a few feet of cement, right? Um, so what the court says is that you don't have to disclose all facts, right? But the sorts of facts that the seller has a duty to disclose are those that are not obvious, those that are latent material defects. Okay. So the court gives this holding. The law appears to be working. See the passive voice, the law appears to be working. No, you're doing it. Take some credit. Admit it. You are you are working the law over it. Don't don't do this. I, I get annoyed when judges try and cloak what they're actually doing. It's 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 this is ingenuous. Just be admit it, you're a common law judge, you're making the law go for it. Uh, if, in fact, in a common law system, in a state, I actually don't have a problem with judges making law because the entire point of common law is it's judge made. This is not constitutional law. So if Florida courts want to reinterpret their common law, that's fine, but just be honest with you. <laughs> Holding is, the law appears to be working toward the ultimate conclusion that full disclosure of all material facts must be made. That full disclosure of all material facts must be made. Professor, what's a material fact? Has to describe what a material fact is. What's a material fact? Has the court defined that phrase? Um, what is it? Uh, it is now said in California that we're selling all the material facts. Well, selling all the facts and children that we've already provided with them. You're reading. I, don't, I want an answer. What's a material oh, that's, fact? That's, 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 What's a material fact? Tell me your own words. Something that's um, obvious, that's substantial. Um, okay. What, what what makes a fact substantial? Give me a synonym. Um, where if uh, the buyer were to go forward, it would substantial effect. It was an arrangement or something that they would not. Okay. Very good. Very close. Okay. The court gives a definition at the very end of the case, and it says, we hold that where the seller of a home knows of facts materially affecting the value of the property, right? When they say material, they're saying that it actually affects the value of the property. Um, that's basically anything, right? Anything, any sort of defect will affect the value of the property, so that doesn't add much. But the, the, the sentence I'm reading from is the important one. We hold that where the seller of a home knows of facts materially affecting the value of the property, here comes the key point, which are not readily available, I'm sorry, not readily observable, and are not known to the buyer. When the facts are not readily observable and not known to the buyer, then the seller is under duty to disclose them to the buyer. So the court says the seller doesn't have to disclose everything. Right? If, you know, easy, easy example, there's, a, there's paint peeling on the wall. Anyone who walks past it can see there's paint peeling. You know, maybe that affects the value of the house, but not in a substantial way. You don't have to disclose that. But if it's not readily observable, termites, cracked foundation, leaky roof, and it's not known to the buyer, then the seller has a duty to disclose it to the buyer. Otherwise, the failure to disclose it results in fraudulent concealment. Fraudulent concealment. And with fraudulent concealment, you can then rescind the contract. So we have a couple concepts here that are introduced. We have the idea of a latent defect, right? So that's a defect that's not really observable. You have the concept of a material fact. It's not any fact, but it's a fact that rises to a certain level where it actually affects the value of the home. And if you have latent defects, 
that concern material fact, that is something the seller has got to disclose. And the failure to do so results in a violation of the law, and you can rescind the contract after that. Okay, questions on the Florida case, Bradley. Well, so going, using this case to go back to the ghost case, they would have to disclose that. Because that's, Why? Because it's latent. So you can't, Are the ghosts latent? Yeah, because there's, there's no way to find... They're not observable. That's exactly right. They're made up. I'm sorry. <laughs> ghosts are the... Ah, well, actually, I, I was thinking about this. Ghosts are the ultimate latent defect. Because even if you get rid of them, they can come back. Whoa. How do you unhaunt the house? You can't. So it's permanently defective. I hope you have a joke or something. Or a garden in some way. Okay, it go. might not be a latent defect uh -huh. because poltergeist means loud ghosts. So oh, by loud. definition, they're making noise. Oh, if it's a true poltergeist. But now, the woman lived there, this actor lived there for 20 years, showed the ghosts only once. So, those are very reserved ghosts. Uh, and Robert. <laughs> uh, earlier you said that the judges wanted to get rid of the doctrine of property after the jury. Uh, you were saying something about the seller in a better economic position. Yeah. Why, why is it that the seller in a better economic position to get rid of the seller? Well, how much money would it take for the seller to realize it's haunted? Or mm -hmm. how much money would it take the buyer to realize it's haunted? I'm saying for the legal roof. Okay. So, how much does the seller already know the, the roof leaks? So how much money would it take to sell to disclose that? Oh, zero, right? Does the buyer know it's a leaky roof? How much money would it take the buyer to disclose that? How much money would the buyer have to spend to determine the roof leaky to know? More than zero. More than zero, right? So the, 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 the seller is in a cheaper position to disclose it than does the buyer. Does that make sense? Other questions? Um, so let, 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 let me summarize a bit uh, for, for today. Um, what we have here is the courts um, slowly and steadily chipping away at the caveat emptor doctrine. Um, in the first case, they say even if you disclose the fact that various restrictions and covenants exist, if there's a violation, that lets you rescind the contract. Um, could the buyer in the first case have hired a lawyer to determine that there was a violation of the ordinance? Yeah, he could have. But the courts are moving the burdens away from the plaintiff, the buyer. Uh, the second case, could the, I don't even know, hire, could the buyer have hired a, 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 a paranormal investigator to determine that there's a haunting in the house? They could have, but again, they shifted the cost to the seller. And the last case, could the buyer have hired a roof engineer, whatever, to, to investigate if it's a leak, yeah, but they're shifting the cost back to the seller. And that's generally the gist of modern property law, shifting the buyer, I'm sorry, shifting the burden away from the buyer and towards um, the seller, okay? Um, I have a little bit of extra time. I want to talk about the exam for a bit. Are there any other questions on this topic? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Think that correlates to the movement towards more buyer brokers as far as yeah, all that's a good question. Liability. Yeah, that's a very good question. Do you think um, it's a lobbyist movement, maybe? Yeah, I don't know about lobbying, but I, th I think your question is fair because um, if you're the buyer, the more people you have on your side, the better. They know a question to ask. But generally, the forms, the disclosure forms are so long, that's going to be really hard for the seller to skip out on something. They're going to have to disclose that. Okay. All right, uh, I got a few minutes left. Let me talk about the exam for a bit. Um, I mentioned this in the first week of class. Uh, okay, yes, ma'am. What about willful ignorance? What do you mean willful ignorance? So um, basically, do you, do you basically have a hunch that something is off with the house that they think that you see a ghost, but you know, you just can't trust it. You're just going to look, but there could actually be a like, description that you're not looking at it. Yeah, you're just not really looking at it. Then, you know, like, do you ask the seller about it? You keep your mouth shut. No, this is a seller who knows of. Oh, the, the seller. Oh, so you know, the seller's being dumb on purpose, right? Yes. 
Oh, I see. Um, I think you have to prove the seller actually knows about it. He doesn't actually know, but but if, if you prove that he was unreasonably keeping his head in the sand, uh, you could probably impute the knowledge to him. Because usually when you see one roach, there are others following. They just they just travel on pairs. Do you have cockroaches that fly? Yeah. Yeah. I, I only realized that recently because I saw it on the wall and I went to go kill it and it started flying away. I know they can do that. <laughs> they bite? Yeah. yeah, they can bite you. <laughs> Alright. What won't bite is the midterm. Oh, no. And the reason why it won't bite is it's, it's a known quantity. Um, so we're going to have our midterm. I think it's in class 14 or 15. I don't know the exact date handy. Um, what I want to show you is... Uh, generally the way I suggest that you go about preparing for the midterm. Um, and we're, we're early, we're in the second week of class, but I know you guys are thinking about this early. Um, the midterm isn't graded, but that doesn't mean you blow it off. And the reason why I say that very strongly is that the grade you get on the midterm is almost certainly going to be the grade you get on the final. Whoa. Very few students move much from the midterm grade. I have numbers in this. I, can, I, I track this every semester. Very few students move much from the midterm grade. Um, you might go from like a B to a B plus, or you know, a, a, an A to an A minus. You know, you go up a third or so. The number of students who actually go from like a, a B to an A is small. People from a C to a B is even smaller. People who get Ds usually stay there. So I want you to take this seriously. Um, the reason why is the sort of preparation you do now at the halfway point will more or less dictate what you get in the final. And I, I can give you the numbers, and I, I'm not lying to you. These are the numbers. People stay the same where they are. Um, so now the question is, okay, Black, and you scare the crap out of me. Uh, uh, how do I go about preparing? Um, the number one way that students tell me they prepared is, and I'm just a quote, I looked over my notes. Um, I had 120 students last semester come to my office, and about 90 of them said the same thing. I looked over my notes. That is not studying. Um, merely looking over your notes and your outlines is, is not studying. It's, it's easy because you're not doing anything. Um, the way to get a good score on the exam is to take old exams. Now, I give you on my syllabus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven old exams, actually six old exams in one midterm, right? Each of the exam has two questions, so you have six times two is 12. You have 13 full questions at your disposal. That's a lot. Um, by the end of the semester, all of you should actually take every one of these exams. And when I say take, I don't mean you looked at it. I mean sit down with 90 minutes in quiet and actually take the exam with your notes in, in the library. Not looking, not distraction. Um, the reason why I suggest that very deliberately is you need to build up the right endurance to take it. You need to have where your notes are, where your outline. And I promise you, every time you take a test, you say, man, here's how I just structure my notes. Oh, this, this outline would be better. Oh, this if I tab this, right? You start learning different ways of preparing. Um, so far more than looking at your notes, actually do the exam. Now, here's where I'm going to test this, right? Um, uh, in the next couple weeks, I'm going to send around a link that all of you will sign up for a time slot. It'll be a 30-minute time slot to meet with me. Not now, but after I grade your papers. And I promise you, the first question I ask will be, how did you prepare for the exam? That's not always my first question. And if you say you looked over your notes, I'll say, no, you didn't prepare for the exam. Right? So don't let me down. Um, before the midterm, all of you should at least take an old midterm under time conditions, 90 minutes, library, go somewhere quiet, you're not going to be distracted. Have your notes with you next to you. Your notes aren't going to help much. It's an open book exam, but the notes aren't going to be very helpful. We'll see why. Um, but you need to practice with actual exam questions. Um, in terms of how you're structuring your outline, it's a very personal question, and I don't think there's any one right way of doing it. Uh, some people do well with book outlines. Some people do well with outlines by hand. Some people do well with... Um, uh, typing outlines, I, I can't tell you what works for you, and I, I won't even try to. But you need to be able to answer the questions, because that's ultimately how I grade you. Uh, now let me walk you through what the midterm looks like. Um, the final exam has two questions. You have three hours. 
Two questions, three hours. So if the midterm makes it easier, you have one question, 90 minutes, right? One and a half hours, okay? You have 90 minutes for one question. Your word limit is a thousand words. Now, why am I giving you a word limit? This is actually the great equalizer, and people don't quite appreciate this. Um, some students are capable of dumping out 4,000 words in an hour. I know who you are, I was one of them, right? And it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. If you throw enough crap on the page, something will stick. Um, that's not a good way of writing an exam, because you don't tell me what you know. The word limit forces you to actually give me a precise answer that I can see you have your thinking straight down. This is actually much more to the advantage of students who don't write a lot than those who do. It's, it's, it's actually an equalizer, and it puts you on the exact same playing field. You all have the same 1,000 words to work with, and I have the same 1,000 words to grade with. It's impossible for me to grade a paper that's 1,000 words with a paper that's 5,000 words. I can't compare those. It's not a fair comparison. Um, so yes, this, this is somewhat uh, uh, unconventional, but it, trust me, it works. Um, one note, I used to have a 500 word limit. I changed it to 1,000. Uh, uh, so if you see any old exams, you can just assume it's 1,000. Don't put more than 500. Okay. Uh, each question has five parts. So you're going to have a fact pattern, some instructions. Uh, you'll have maybe a paragraph or so of instruction. The fact pattern is maybe about a page and a half to two pages. It varies. You're not going to spend the entire time reading the fact pattern. Maybe it's two pages. Maybe it's three. I try to keep it at two pages. And then you have five questions. One, two, three, four, five, right? Um, you know that you have a thousand words. You have five subparts. Do some math. That tells you roughly 200 words per question. Your exam software has a word count in it. I'm gonna say this once, I don't have to repeat it. Use the word count and not the character count. Every year, a student writes a thousand characters. That is basically four text messages. Everyone knows a character is a word, a symbol, or a space, right? I, I'm going to give you this warning. One of you will do it. I promise. They'll freak out. They'll write four sentences, and that's their paper. You'll fail. <laughs> You're laughing, but there are people in your preceding classes that did exactly that. I can't help you, so I'm warning you very strongly. Actually, I've added to the instructions, do a word count, not a character count. This way, I have no, no, no blood in my hands if you do that. Also, you have 90 minutes. You have 100, I'm sorry, you have a, a 90 minutes to do five questions. Right, 90 minutes for five questions. Let's say it takes you 30 minutes to read the fact pattern. I think it's actually a good time frame. Take, an, take a full 30 minutes to read the question. Oh, read it twice if you have to. That leaves you over an hour to do five questions. It means you have roughly 12 minutes per question. Oh, I would give you 10 so you have time left over. So give yourself 30 minutes to read the fact pattern, and then do 10 minutes per question. Uh, a lot of you have difficulty with time. You shouldn't, but you will. If you use my strategy, read the question for 30 minutes, 10 minutes per question, you're guaranteed to finish. The easiest way to mess your score up is not finish, because every year I do papers where number five is left blank, and that gets you a big zero. Right? You're starting off with a zero on, on the last one. Okay. So make sure you get yourself time right. You don't want to run out of time and you know, scri scri scribble some garbage for number five because then you're not going to get good scores. Um, also, and this is getting a little bit ahead of myself, I'll explain this now. I encourage you, before you even read the fact pattern, to read the five questions at the end. These are your guides, right? And this is what's guiding you towards the right answer. Um, I, use, I don't just say, here's a fact pattern, discuss all relevant legal issues. Um, those are awful grades to exam because people go all over the place. I'm going to give you very specific questions that ask very specific items. Make sure you answer those. Um, so I want you, before the midterm, to at least take the mid. This one's from 2015. I haven't taught this class in a, like two years, uh, but still good. Uh, you should know virtually everything on this exam. But before the midterm, I want you to take this at home. Um, and when you come to see me for our midterm review, which will be mostly in the month of November, basically the month of November, Book solid, well, nothing but you guys. Uh, I'm going to ask you, so how'd you study for the exam? And you're going to say, I took your midterm. And if you don't, <laughs> we'll have a different conversation because then you didn't do what you're supposed to do. Okay? Questions on this or anything else in the class? I want you to do well. I'm giving you every conceivable ingredient to do well. If you don't, it's your fault. 
uh, it, you have to take the initiative. Yes, sir. At what point do we know enough material to start taking uh, I'd say, you know, maybe after, yeah, maybe at three weeks, you can try to do it. Um, even if you can't do everything, do enough of it, right? But the midterm is by class number 14 or 15, so about like maybe class number 10, you probably have enough. It's 15, thank you, by class 10, by class 11. But don't wait too long, because even, I'll, I'll be honest with you, right? Even if you don't know all the stuff, the act of taking it will will put you in the right mind frame. Maybe tweak your notes for the midterm, right? And maybe oh, I got I got to restructure my outline. This is not working for me, right? So uh, maybe after class ten or so, I think that's a good good middle point. What else? What else is on your mind? What else is on your mind? Anything else? Yep, they're all the same. They're all up there. I posted all my old questions. There's no mystery. No multiple choice, just two essays. This is why I hate these sort of questions. You notice I never say that here's a clearly correct answer because I don't like the true false questions. I like the true false questions throughout the class because it gives you, you have to pick a side, right? You can't wiggle one way or the other. Uh, but I will never pass on that. Uh, the exams don't have a single right or wrong answer. They only have many right answers. Okay, Robert? Uh, so the two essays are both going to have five subparts? Exactly. Yep, read over, re skim them just to get a sense of flavor. But I put them all in the syllabus. There's no surprise. Anything else? All right, a few minutes early. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>